He said, to the extent I desire to move through you, you must allow me to cut on you. The Leader's Cut. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to The Leader's Cut. If you're joining us for the first time, let me just say it's a pleasure to have you join the conversation with us. Make sure to jump down in the comments. If you feel the Lord just highlight one of the one-liners, like a bomb in your spirit, or one of the things I love for people to do is just drop in a prayer request. I love to be praying specifically over you and with you. Uh, so just jump in. I, I want to ask you to do something that I've never asked you to do before because of what we're talking about today. This is something the Lord's allowed me to learn over the last couple decades and with zero hype or hyperbole. I'm telling you right now, if I was trying to give you as a leader some of the best gold I feel like the Lord's allowed me to gain, this would be some of it. I'm telling you right now, uh, th this, I've actually, it, it's so gold-ish to me that I hesitate on teaching this publicly because I don't want someone to use it for ill-gotten gain. Because if, if and when you learn these things, you, in my opinion, a person gets ahead and they're ahead of their peers and not that it's a contest, but I'm just telling you, I, I've seen these things up close and personal work and I've seen an absence of these things be very detrimental to one's cause and calling. So here's what I'm asking you to do. Would you share the link to this teaching with someone in your life that you respect as a leader that you would love to see become one of the best leaders you know. So whether they're the best leader you already know or a leader you want to become one of the best leaders you know, you're rooting for them, you want to see God bless them, would you send this to them? Because I think whatever God's asking them to do, the three things we're going to talk about today are going to play an essential role in their leadership as they walk down that path. All right. So as you saw in the thumbnail, we're going to talk about three questions great leaders must answer, which means we're talking about three things great leaders must have. But before we do, let's pray, invite the Holy Spirit into our time together. Spirit of the living God, would you invade this time together? We are so desperate for you. No matter what's going on, in each of our worlds, no matter what challenges we're presently facing, good or bad, highs or lows, we always need you. And you know my heart, there's really no reason for us to spend any time talking if you're not going to be all up in this conversation. So Holy Spirit, we yield ourselves. We lay down on the, the ER table of heaven where the divine surgeon can cut on us. There's going to be some stuff in this one that may hurt a little bit to cut off. Holy Spirit, would you by your gentle touch and with the knife of heaven cut on us in every place where we need some heavenly cutting. We stand down. We lay down. Do whatever you want with this time. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so I'm going to give you three questions. And we're, I don't know how long this teaching is going to be. Uh, it, it could be a little long. It just depends the way things go because there is a ton of meat up in this thing and, and a bunch of one-liners. And so you may want to get out a pad and a pen. You may want to hit the pause button every once in a while just so you can write things down as they come on the screen. But please hear my heart. It, it's taken a lot of work to learn these things, and, and I'm giving you some stuff. You hearing this is a test, so be a good steward, all right? I'm not telling you this is awesome. I'm telling you this is expensive. So do what you need to do to not just retain this, but to literally grow as a result of it, all right? Here's question number one. Am I self-aware? Am I 
self-aware. Let's define being self-aware or self-awareness. When I look at me and see what God and others see. Now, as an employer, one of the first things I look for is self-awareness. I've learned, I don't know if I've talked about this on the cup before, but one of the things I learned as a leader early on that I didn't know I needed to know, as a leader, you need to know who's going to be miserable around you. And one of the things I learned early on in this line of work as a senior pastor is that people who are not self-aware are not going to do well around me. Here's why. If you don't understand you, how can you help anyone become them? And self-awareness involves not just being aware of me, but understanding me and where I'm at and what I'm doing. Leadership is far more about helping other people grow than it is about telling them where to go. It's impossible for you to grow others if you don't know where you yourself need to grow. First Timothy chapter 4, verse 16 says, Keep a close watch on how you live and on your teaching. Stay true to what is right for the sake of your own salvation and the salvation of those who hear you. Okay, how I'm doing and where I'm at clearly has an impact on how others do and how and what they're able to do. Self-awareness is essential for every leader. And some of the worst leaders I've ever been around are those who are least self-aware. Now, question before I read you this next passage, why would a person not be self-aware? Is it ignorance or is it by choice? I actually think it's by choice. I think the reason that a lot of people aren't self-aware is they're so afraid of what they'll find, they never dig. And so that they're completely ignorant to where they're at, what they're doing, and how they're doing it. Romans 12 verse 3 says, Because of the privilege and authority God has given me, I give each of you this warning. Don't think you are better than you really are. Okay, that's, that's one of the traps that comes when we're not self-aware. We just think we're doing awesome. So we don't even pay attention to how we're actually doing. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves. This has got to be one of the best self-awareness verses in the entire Bible. Be honest in your assessment, your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourselves by the faith God has given you. Now, let's talk about some of the dangers of a lack of self-awareness. Before I read you this next passage, I, I'm just going to admit, this passage is literally cutthroat, okay? It's bloody. It's bloody. It, it's harsh, uh, it's direct, and some of us aren't used to Scripture speaking to us like this or God speaking to us like this through Scripture. But listen to the principle addressed in Proverbs chapter 23, verses 1 through 3. While dining with a ruler, someone with power, someone with influence, pay attention to what is put before you. If you're a big eater, put a knife to your throat. Don't desire all the delicacies for he might be trying to trick you. Well, there is so much meat in this passage, all right? First, we see self-awareness in, involves me knowing my negative or weak tendencies. This passage in Proverbs says, if you're a big eater, okay, I would have to know if I'm a big eater. And then it says, once you know your Achilles, do something about it. Preston, if you have to, instead of put the fork to your mouth, put a knife to your throat, this is figuratively speaking, obviously. Do it. Don't desire everything at the table. Don't be a pig, Preston. You're being tested by the leader at the table. Okay, let's talk about these two dangers I want you to understand. The first danger of a lack of self-awareness is you won't grow. You cannot grow. If you don't know how you're doing, you'll never see a need to improve. And how will you ever improve if you don't think you need to improve? Hey, in, in all the marriage counseling I've done, this uh, is one of the, the big disappointments in marriage. 
and it comes with a lack of self-improvement. I've told you this before, but Holly and I, one of our rules is, it's okay where you are today, just don't be there tomorrow. And this is related to our weaknesses, areas where we need to grow. It's okay where you are today. Just don't stay there. Don't, don't be there tomorrow. One of the worst messages you can send to someone you love related to any of your weaknesses is this. It's always going to be like this. It's always going to be this way. One of the best messages you can send is this. It's not always going to be this way. It's just that way today. But by God's grace and my gritty determination to grow, it won't be like this tomorrow. This is just something I've kind of learned from a front row seat, being around a lot of leaders. Leaders who are not self-aware very rarely grow. And when they do, they usually don't grow in the right spots because they're not even aware enough of their weaknesses. This is one of the reasons... Reasons in my line of work, I go and watch my messages multiple times because I want to learn. I have certain tendencies. And because I want to grow, I need to be aware of where I am. Let me say it like this. To the extent you want to grow, it will be revealed by the extent to which you are aware of your weaknesses. If you lack self-awareness, you won't grow. Here's the second danger that I see with a lack of self-awareness. It reveals bad stewardship. Do you ever feel like you have a bug like, or a spider like walking on your face? I don't know if something came down, but I keep trying to, like, in a dignified manner, wipe it off my face. But I'm telling you, something was crawling on my, my head. Those of you who have hair, you can't feel that kind of thing. But those of us who don't, we got to, we feel it. Bad stewardship is revealed with a lack of self-awareness. If you're not improving yourself, you reveal you can't handle yourself, let alone anyone else. You don't know much about anything if you don't know anything about yourself. Let's talk about this as parents. How can I steward my kids if I cannot steward myself well? But how can I steward myself well if I don't know where I myself am? Do you see the connection with self-awareness? Don't use the excuse that you got so much going on in your life that you can't be aware of where you're at. That is the fastest way to crash a ship, all right? Godly leadership involves being a good example of doing things God's way. This is good stewardship. And in order to pull that off, I constantly need to be monitoring where I'm at, how I'm doing what I'm doing. The more self-aware you are, the more God-conscious you will be. I learned this as I confronted my faults. I used to be really deathly afraid of confronting my faults. But I learned something. When I had the courage to confront my faults, I became very encouraged and comforted by God's perfection. I don't dwell on my weaknesses, but I do try and recognize them, learn from them, and strengthen them. Let me show you the other side of this coin of, of self-awareness. The opposite side of the coin is self-consciousness. And the more self-conscious you are, the less God-focused you have become. If, if God and I are in the same room and it's just the two of us, as it relates to my focus, there are only two options, him or me. Self-aware, I have an understanding of where I am without being fixated on where or who I am, but I am more conscious of God in the room than I am aware of myself in the moment. But the other side, when you become self-conscious, it's usually because you've become less God-focused. Now, Let's cover two inhibitors to self-awareness, all right? Here's inhibitor number one, self-consciousness. I'll give you um, my definition of self-conscious. When you are more focused on what others think than with what God sees. Okay, I'm going to use kind of a, a silly 
illustration. Uh, if you can't tell uh, from that camera, let's we'll do it this way. I have a slanted up nose. Okay, it's just the way God made me. And back in the day, from time to time, I would get a little bit. Uh, starting in junior high, I would get a little self conscious, and it started when one of the kids in my class started making a joke about tree trunks. I'll never forget this. I was like, I, I have no idea what this means. You remember what it was like when your friends around you in junior high or high school had an inside joke and you didn't know what it was? Okay, this is one of those moments. They're all walking around going, Preston has tree trunks. Preston has tree trunks. I have no idea what that means. Finally, one of my friends told me, it's a lot of nose hair. And the reason they could see all of my nose hairs is because my nose naturally slants up. Okay. Now, here's what would happen. When I would be self-conscious about it, I'd be in a conversation with someone focused on their eyes, whether or not they were on my nose. They'd be talking and I, I wouldn't even be listening to anything they're saying because I'm just watching their eyes to see, are they watching my nose? Are they, are they watching my nose? Here, maybe if I put it down like this. I, okay, self-consciousness can literally suck the life out of you. I, I don't ever want to think that way because it costs me too much energy. Self-awareness means I recognize something can be a problem, so I deal with it preemptively before it becomes a problem, all the while not fixating on it. Okay, so let's, in that silly illustration of my nose, the nose hairs, what does that mean? Well, if I'm afraid people are going to see what's in my nose, that I have a dirty nose, what can I do? Shave my nose hairs. I know this is TMI for some of you. We're just getting practical up in this mug. When I was self-conscious. I, a healthy self-consciousness is self-awareness. I was aware, hey, I just need to make sure things are okay, that I'm clean, and then I move on. And if things weren't clean, it's okay. Self-conscious people, on the other hand, make things a part of the conversation, even if they're not being noticed. This I see this a lot with people in the lobby or when they come up to talk to me. They'll talk about their mistakes. They'll talk about their past. They'll talk about something that's off with them. And here's what I've learned. It's because they're self-conscious. They bring up these things because that's what they think I'm thinking about. And so they are trying to preemptively address them. Well, that's not self-awareness. That's self-consciousness. So it would be like this. Back to the silly nose picture. It would be like being in a conversation and the person I'm talking to is like this. <laughs> and back in the day, I'd be like, oh, I got something in my nose. I know it. They're like trying to send me a message. And so I just trying to like dignify, clean out my nose. Like, listen, I'm not even in the conversation because I am too conscious of what others might be thinking of me. I will tell you from experience, self-awareness is awesome, but self-consciousness can be catastrophic. Don't go that far. And the enemy will always want to get you self-conscious. He'll always whisper what some, the narrative someone else might be thinking about or, or saying behind your back. It will create nothing but self-consciousness. I don't want to focus on myself. I can't save myself. I want to be aware of myself, but not too conscious. When you're self-conscious, it makes others self-conscious. And when two people are in a self-conscious conversation, neither are concerned with or, or concentrating on the Holy Spirit because they're too fixated on themselves. Genesis 2.25 says, Now the man and his wife were both naked in the garden, and they felt no shame. But watch this. After the fall, Genesis 3 verse 7 says, At that moment, their eyes were open." And they suddenly felt shame. What is shame? A heaviness that comes with self-consciousness. There were things they were not aware of before sin that they immediately became aware of after sin. What did they become aware of? Their nakedness. So they sewed up fig leaves together to, to cover themselves. What changed in the garden? It wasn't just sin. Sin had ramifications. Sin introduced another way 
to see things. Everything is, was fine in the garden as long as they saw things the way God did and the way God wanted them to see things. But the second sin entered the picture. Sin introduced another way to see everything. And notice that's how Satan came to Eve. He tried to get her to see the tree a different way. No way, no. If you struggle with self-consciousness, here's what you'll do. You will hide much and be able to help few. This is their response. Once they became aware of their nakedness, and we all have areas of nakedness. Once Adam and Eve became aware of their nakedness, what was their immediate response? To hide. To cover. But I need you to understand this as a leader. Anything you hide is going to have negative implications in regards to your leadership. Because anytime you hide something from those you lead, there will always be a limit to how far you can take them and how much you can help them. You cannot lead people doing like this. And we're going to talk about vulnerability in the third question. But I need you to understand, self-consciousness can be catastrophic. Don't go from self-aware to self-conscious. When I'm self-aware, the, the major difference I see between the two, self-awareness and self-consciousness, self-awareness is when I stand with God and we talk about where I'm at. Self-consciousness is when I stand with the enemy and he tells me where he thinks I'm at. It makes me very self-conscious. Here's the second inhibitor. So we have self-consciousness. Now we got to talk about what I, I term them consciousness. Here's my definition for them conscious. When you are more focused on what others are doing than on what you should be doing. First Corinthians chapter nine, verse 24 says, don't you realize in a race, everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize. So run to win. Love this verse. Feel like I always have to bring it up with leaders. And here's why, because I used to feel like I was in a rat race until the Lord gave me the illustration that he and I were seated at a table that had a reservation on it and no one else could sit at our table together. And once he helped me see that, now I know I'm not competing against the rest of you. Your calling isn't a race, it's your assignment. And if you see your calling as a race, you'll always be too concerned with those you see as your competition. Now, how do you keep from competing? Simple, focus on your assignment rather than on their accomplishments. Galatians chapter 6, verse 4, got to be the best verse for this, says, pay careful attention to your own work, for then you will get the satisfaction of a job well done, and you won't need to compare yourself to anyone else. Pay attention to your work. Don't be them conscious. It doesn't matter what God's doing with them. What matters is are you preparing for what God wants to do with, through, and for you? Self-awareness, biggie. Am I self-aware? Here's the second question I want you to ask. Am I appropriate? Am I appropriate? This is what I like to call room awareness. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 16 and 17 says, So be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity. This is a great principle. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Understand what this passage is talking about. I'm also using it as a principle for life, all right? <laughs> I've been inappropriate before, and I think sometimes when we think about inappropriateness, we think about off-colored jokes, um, using language that goes too far. That's, that's not how I see being inappropriate. Uh, the way I see doing something inappropriate 
uh, is inappropriate is when I do the wrong thing in the moment. So that can be any number of things. All right. When what is called for inappropriate is I do the opposite of what's called for. I'll give you an example. Just so you can see, it can be small things and big things. I remember sitting in a meeting years ago, and there was a guy who was new to the staff uh, in Dallas, and he had done some good stuff um, at, at other churches. If I remember right, one of the things that you know kind of came with him, he, he was one of the potential successors at the big church he was at before. So he kind of came in. And, and from my young vantage point, a little bit on his horse. And uh, very quickly, I learned this guy was not self-aware at all. But not just that, he wasn't room aware. So what you got to know, this is just between the two of us, a lot of my lessons come from watching the mistakes of everyone else in the room. <laughs> One of the hardest things about being the leader is you actually have to lead. Where... Years ago, when I wasn't the leader, I could just sit in the room and learn from the mistakes of everyone else in the room leading. Well, a lot of what I've learned comes from the mistakes of others. This guy was tasked with leading this meeting with a bunch of people from a bunch of different departments at very high levels of the organization. And this guy came in leading the meeting. It's the loudest I have ever heard anyone speak in a meeting in my life. No exaggeration. I mean, I, I want to, to mimic it, but you'll it, it's gonna hurt your ears, okay? Just imagine the loudest level of inappropriate volume in a meeting that you could, could comprehend and then add about 50% to it. It was that ridiculous. It was so ridiculous that no one in the room could focus on what he was saying. And, and the longer the meeting went, everyone's just trying not to laugh. This guy had no idea. The meeting was a total joke. Why? He wasn't self-aware, but he also wasn't room aware. He was stepping into a conversation that had been going for years. And he inserted himself, kind of it seemed like, with the thought, I'm just going to do things my way because this is how I do it. And I, as the young guy, I just sat there. I don't even think I talked in that whole meeting. I just remember thinking, never be that guy where you are the antithesis of room aware. Let's talk about the other side of that coin. Here's a question with three parts to it. Am I aware of the room I'm in, the company I'm in, and the moment we are in. This is what room awareness is. Am I aware of the room? The company I'm in. So not the company company, but the actual people company I'm in. And the moment we are in. One of the best pieces of advice I could give to a young leader is study the room before you speak your first word in the room. I, this used to be one of my Achilles where I, I just, when I was young, I'd want to be heard. So I'd walk into a meeting and the first chance I got to speak, I, I was opening up my mouth. And in the time leading up to when I opened my mouth, I wasn't studying the room. I was just getting more and more excited to speak. Idiot. I've learned since then, before I speak, study the room. Low-level leaders know the time the meeting starts. High-level leaders know the room, their company, and the moment. God can empower you for a moment, but if you can't recognize it, you will not step into it, let alone make the most of it. So I want to talk to you about the room for a sec, uh, because if we're going to talk about room awareness, we got to talk about the room and and especially with young leaders there seems to be this obsession with getting into the room all right and you know exactly what i mean when i say that it's typically i want to be in the room where the decisions are made i want to be in the room you know 
where the most power is, the most authority, whatever, however you define it. But it's that whole, I just want to get into the room. Too many spend years trying to get into the room. Don't ruin it by not recognizing it when you walk in. Here's what I mean. Some see getting into the room as a literal thing. I will tell you from experience, typically the way you get invited into the room is they realize you can handle the room because outside of the room, you're already acting as though you were in the room. Before you ever walk into the room, God wants to teach you to walk in the anointing it will take to stay in the room and make the most of your time there. Don't get fixated on a specific room. Don't make the room your goal. Make impact in every room your goal. Again, big for any leader, but especially young leaders. How can you prove to God? How can you show the Lord you're ready for the next room? I think it's really simple. Make an impact in every room you ever walk into. If you make the most important room the most important room to you, I, I personally don't think God's going to give you oil to be in that room. Even if you get an invitation, I don't think there's going to be oil for it because you've turned the room into an idol. The Lord's not about the room. He's about the people in the room. One of the best ways you and I can show the Lord we're ready for a newer room, a heavier room, a more authoritative room is by making an impact, a godly impact in every room we walk into. Two questions I want you to ask in every room you walk into. Question number one, why are we in this room? I'm giving you a cheat code right here, young bucks, young does. Don't mean to be disrespectful with either of those. We, we live a lot of companies run on meeting culture, you know, and, and they just occupy time and, and nothing comes of them. So here's what I'm, I'm going to teach you to do. The way to answer the question, why are we in this room, is to first think about the person who called the meeting and ask yourself some questions. What are they hoping to get out of this meeting? A good leader at the very beginning of the meeting will tell everyone what they're looking to get. Listen when they tell you. Maybe you hear it outside of the meeting before the meeting even happens. If you know why everybody is in the room, you can help with what happens while everybody is in that room. Second question, why does God have me in this room? This is a blend of self-awareness and room awareness. Why does God have me in this room? I, I remember, idiot me, I remember when I first uh, stepped into the elders meetings in Dallas, the board. I just thought, you know, I was in that room to, to bring what I had, you know, just such an idiot. And I learned very quickly, God had me in that room to learn, not to lead. And here's why this is an important question to answer. If you don't know why God has you in the room, you'll run the risk of wasting your time there. In any room you will waste your time in, God will eventually remove you from. So why does God have you in the room? I don't care why you want to be in the room. I don't care why you think you're in the room. And typically, the reason you think you're in the room is totally different than the reason God has you in the room. Unless you've heard the Lord tell you why. Some rooms you're going to be into, in, and God's goal is for you to learn. Some rooms he's going to have you in, it's to lead. Some rooms it's going to be to minister, to help. Do you know why God has you in the room? It's not just to prepare for the future. It's to do something right now. You need to know what that is. You, I believe you will be viewed as one of the best leaders everybody around you knows if every time you walk into a room, your goal is to know in your heart why God has you in the room 
and to give a gift in the room that God gave you to give someone or everyone in the room. All right. Second part of this equation that I want to talk about uh, is the company, the people in the room. Three questions to ask about the people in the room. Here's question number one. Who is the leader in the room? You need to know. Who's the leader in this room? Now, that's not always the person with the most authority in the organization who happens to be in the room. Who's leading this room? Not who's the most powerful, not who has the highest or best title. Who's the leader in the room? If you're not the leader, always take your cue from the leader. This is why you got to know who it is. Never talk more than or louder than the leader. It's practical advice. And if you are the leader, never talk the most. Something I've had to work on. I, I communicate for a living and sometimes I'll get too comfortable with my own voice. How can others step into the leadership anointing God has for them if they can't get a word in edgewise? Now, let me say, the other side of that coin is, if somebody gives you room to talk, you better come with it. It's not a time for you just to give your opinion. You better come with the heat. When I was a young man, I just wanted to be heard. As an older man, I want to help. Big difference and massive motive difference. Second question. Who's the newest person in the room? This is really important to know. Okay. And, and I don't mean you. Other than you, who's the newest person in the room? I can't tell you how much I've learned by being in a meeting uh, that consistently happen. So weekly or twice a month. By simply watching the newest people in the room. If you will watch and learn from the newest people in the room, you will save yourself a ton of time and a ton of difficulty. Never, ever, ever pattern your behavior after someone who just got their seat at the table. Never. It doesn't matter how awesome they are. They're learning the protocol of the palace. Don't pattern your behavior after theirs. Low-level leaders use the ignorant behavior of newbies as an excuse to do whatever they feel like doing rather than doing what is needed. An example of this, if, if somebody new in the room doesn't understand how the room works and they kind of just tell a sarcastic joke and you love sarcasm and no one else in the room uses sarcasm except this newbie. And if you're not in the best place, what will you do? Oh, well, so-and-so tells sarcastic jokes. So can I. Stop, stop. Stop patterning your behavior after the low-hanging fruit. Don't pattern your behavior after those who don't even understand the protocol of the palace. Okay, Who's the newest in the room? Watch them. Learn from them. In the same way, when, when you know who the leader is, I did this with Pastor Robert so many times. I would just watch what he'd, he would do. And I would take my cue from him. Another piece of advice, if you don't know what to do, mimic the leader. Do what they do. You know how many hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times I didn't know what to do in a meeting? I just took my cue from the leader. And then on the opposite side of that coin, I never did what those who were newest in the room were doing. I follow the lead of the most tenured people in the room. Question number three, who's the most respected in the room? Something else I learned. The person who might be leading the room might not be the most respected. So someone else to really watch in a meeting. Who's the most respected? Pay attention to their consistent habits. Because the consistent habits of those who garner the most respect in the room can help you begin to earn the respect 
of everyone else in the room. The best way to keep from putting your foot in your mouth is to keep your feet on the same path as the one traveling in the wisest direction. Another cheat code of mine. I mimic the most respected men and women in the room. I, I would watch uh, in the senior team meeting, for instance, back in Dallas. I would watch how Robert respected everyone. And of course, he was never disrespectful. I'm talking about the different levels of respect, the different levels of trust. And I would constantly be asking questions. Why, why does it seem like every time this person talks, he stops what he's doing and, and listens to every word intently. Why, on the other hand, does he not seem to be quite as focused when this person talks? Within a couple months, oh, I see why, on both sides. Read the room. Don't act like you belong in the room because that will keep you from ever reading the room. I, I wish I could just impart this anointing to you it's just something for whatever reason god gave me and it's probably because i just made so many mistakes in so many rooms when i was younger be room aware i want you to be self-aware but i want you to be even more aware when you're in that room so that you can continue to grow at an extremely rapid pace all right here's the third question that every great leader needs to ask, answer, am I vulnerable? All great leaders are vulnerable leaders. In my opinion, you can't be a great leader without being a vulnerable leader. Vulnerability is not self-deprecation. It's a publicly honest self-assessment. I used to get really frustrated by this. Uh, that great leaders have to be bravely vulnerable. And the reason I hated it is because I kind of grew up thinking that vulnerability makes you look weak. So I didn't understand how vulnerability works. And, and here's what I'll tell you. If you choose not to be vulnerable in the midst of your accomplishments, you make yourself vulnerable to many attacks. When you refuse to be vulnerable, you are vulnerable to attack. The greatest displays of strength always involve the greatest moments of vulnerability. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 9 and 10 say, My grace is all you need. My power, God says, works best in weakness. So now I'm glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. This is why I take pleasure in my weakness. Paul would talk about his, his weaknesses. He was vulnerable. He was honest about it. Where did he learn this from? Jesus. Now, did Jesus have weaknesses? No, but Jesus was always vulnerable. He never had to act like the strongest person in the room, even though he was. And one of the reasons I think Jesus pulled vulnerability off better than anybody else is because of a, a principle related to humans. Fear of being taken advantage of is the number one reason why people refuse to be vulnerable. Jesus was never afraid of being taken advantage of. When everyone else was freaking out about Judas, he wasn't worried about being taken advantage of. Even when he was sold for some silver. Because Jesus wasn't afraid of being taken advantage of by any human on the earth, he was able to be the most vulnerable human who ever walked the face of the earth. Better to reach many being vulnerable and be taken advantage of by a few than to reach a few without being vulnerable and not be taken advantage of by any. Jesus was taken advantage of, sure. People used his vulnerability, but his vulnerability was never weakness. It was a choice. It was a choice. You don't need to be afraid of what others will do with your vulnerability. You don't need to be worried about being taken advantage of. 
No matter what others do with your vulnerability, your words, your worth, and your value will always remain intact. Genesis 127, so God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created me, you. I don't need to be worried about people taking care of my, taking advantage of my vulnerability. Listen, has it happened before? Yeah, lots of times. Is it that big of a deal? No. No. Now, I remember saying once to Pastor Robert, I said, listen, I feel like I have to literally humiliate myself in front of people for them to follow me. And he started chuckling because he knew it's a principle of leadership. The number one reason why vulnerability is so important is this. Vulnerability is the key that unlocks the hearts of those you were created to lead. You can't help people if you're on a pedestal so high that you can't reach them. And vulnerability is what keeps you always within heart's reach. Your vulnerability helps people see through to your heart that you are after nothing more than their heart. But if you refuse to show vulnerability, People aren't going to feel safe around you. Vulnerability is a superpower. You've heard Tim talk about this. You've heard me talk about it. It is a superpower. And if you feel like you always have to be the strongest one in the room, it's actually because you're the weakest right now. But you know who the strongest in the room is, in my opinion, in part by who the most vulnerable happens to be. Want me to prove it to you? Jesus. Could he not have gotten off of that cross? He had access to all power in heaven and on earth. A host of angels. Having all that strength, having access to it all. Did he choose to use it? Nope. The greatest act of strength in the history of humanity just so happens to be Simultaneously, the greatest display of vulnerability Earth will ever know. You'll never be vulnerable if you're not self-aware. And you'll never be vulnerable if you're so them conscious that you hide what you're a little bit self-conscious about. I'll just tell you from experience, it feels so good to be vulnerable. (laughs) It might annoy you from time to time. It feels so good, though. It it legit feels wonderful to just say, here's where I'm at or here's where I messed up. And that's been a, a real process for me. I've had to really work on getting comfortable being vulnerable. Can you? Can you settle in and get comfortable with your weaknesses, your shortcomings? Can you be honest about where, where you tripped up today? I feel like I've helped people learn far more sharing my mistakes and my weaknesses than I will ever be able to help them by sharing just my strength and my gifting. Jesus was our model of vulnerability. And if we're going to follow him, we're going to have to be more vulnerable. I'm telling you right now, I need you to hear this. Okay. There's a room that God wants to take you in. A curtain God wants to take you behind. But if you have no idea where you are right now, you will be completely incapable of stewarding a holy moment in that room when you walk in. You have got to know where you are and how you're doing with what you're doing. Then you need to be room aware. 
you can't just walk in. You can't just barge into the room and act like, well, it's my time. No, it's not going to work. You need to study the room. I wish I could literally just reach through the camera right now and grab you by the ears and say, don't rush into the room. Study the room long before you walk into the room. That way, once you're in the room, you'll have more oil than anybody else in the room. Study that room before you walk into it. And then... Remember, once you get into that room, one of the ways to stay there that is mandatory, I believe, uh, as God lays things out, is it's going to require vulnerability. You can't act like the guy. You can't act like the dude. You can't act like the chick. Oh, I got... No, no, you're going to have to be vulnerable. We connect to one another in weakness. We help one another with strength. But we connect through weakness. The room he wants to walk you into, it's a doozy. And I don't know if you're ready for it or not. But I know if you will really take to heart what we talked about today, once you get that invitation, if you'll just hold God's hand and do what he says, and say what you hear him say, you're going to be fine but I love you too much to lie to you. If you're not in the room yet, there's always a reason. Get to work. You have a little more time to prepare. Get more self-aware. Become more room aware. Get comfortable being more vulnerable. Do that, you'll be ready. And I know you'll knock it out of the park when you get into the room. And even better, you'll get to stay there for a while. That's one of my goals for you. I don't want to see you achieve your goal of getting into the room. I don't care. No offense. What I want, I don't want you to visit the land of the promise. I want you to remain there. But There's a protocol to remaining in that room. And I'm trying to teach you some of what's involved. And not just getting there, but being able to stay there. I'm going to pray over you. And... Just ask the Lord to give you the oil of heaven. Not to enter the room, but to steward the room. Lord, I know that some, once we get to the prayer, just turn off the conversation. And so for my brothers and sisters, for my aunts and uncles who are watching this, as I pray right now, Spirit of the living God, I ask that you would open up the windows of heaven over them. God, you're teaching me so much about influence and, and you have a, a purpose for it. One of influence's highest purposes is to help people. That's kingdom. It's not to get what I want. It's to be able to give you more of what you want. Lord, I pray over my brothers and sisters who are not yet in the room. Holy Spirit, would you help them become more aware of who they are, where they are, and how they're doing with all they're doing. They're never going to be able to grow others if they first don't learn where they need to grow. Then, Lord, I pray for a supernatural anointing to be room aware. That every room my brothers and sisters walk into, Spirit of the living God, you'd be speaking to them. You'd be showing them things that no one else in the room can see. You're leading them into the room so they can lead on your behalf. So would you help them become immediately aware of all the various moving parts in the room. Give them an anointing to learn as they study the most respected leader in the room. Would you give them an anointing to learn from the mistakes of the newbies so that they won't have to 
make some of those same mistakes and can steward their time in the room even better. God, I also pray that if there are any walls up in the heart of any of my brothers or sisters, that would keep them from being more vulnerable as a leader. Holy Spirit, I ask you to cut right now. Cut at the root of that wall. And I ask you, would you cause it by your divine, powerful hand? Would you cause that wall to come crumbling down? Jesus, would you help us lead more like you? We don't need to fear being taken advantage of because you are with us. Oh God. Help us never to forget that. Help me to be more vulnerable. God, would you just hear our hearts? We don't want to get into the room for notoriety. We don't want to get into the room to feel powerful or more special. We just want to go into the room if you want us to. And once we go in, we just want to steward the moment in the room, however you want it to be stewarded. Holy Spirit, would you cut wherever we need cuts to make more room, to steward the room every time we walk into one? In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I want to tell you how much I enjoy our time together. I enjoy getting to just sit and have a little coffee, have a little hot tea. pray that when we get together, not just that it helps, but that God speaks to you. Uh, I love you so, so much. And I love our time together. Just know I'm praying for you. And if there's anything, I can come alongside you and pray uh, with you or over you. Throw it in the comments because I'd love to walk alongside of you. All right. I love you so much. God bless you. Can't wait to see you again next week.